boys today. Now come back with me to um, uh, Ephesians chapter 1. I've not mentioned to you a little known fact that uh, to some folks, Ephesians is the hidden book of the Bible. Uh, well, actually, it's only known to one person I'm aware of, and I'm that person. I have always loved these tabs that you put on your Bible that gives you the impression of knowing where all the books of the Bible are located. I do know how to find them even without the tabs, but you know, I, I, I've liked that. And uh, when I got this new Bible several years back, I, I made the same mistake that I made once before. I put the tabs on, it was either during the World Series or the NFL playoffs, and you can get distracted doing that. So I put, I got, you know, Galatians was going to be the top one in the next row, and I put Galatians on just right. But instead of putting Ephesians below it, I put it immediately behind Galatians. So if you look at my Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, and if, you have to find Ephesians in there. But hey, I found it, and I'm really glad and we're continuing in Ephesians this morning as we come to uh, chapter 1, verse 11. Now, you've heard the hassles that go on in our world over inheritances. You have to determine who are the rightful heirs. And there's the issue of paying the taxes and all the, orgu all the arguments that can come up over who gets what especially if somebody doesn't have a will. Then there's a resentment about what one receives compared to what another receives. And then there are the whimsical changes that can be made by dying people who get sideways with somebody. There are the legal technicalities and a whole bunch of factors that can foul up an inheritance and greatly diminish its value. Well, I have good news for you. You have an inheritance in Christ. And it is absolutely guaranteed and no one can take anything away from it. It's secured by the power and the integrity of God Himself and it includes a, a, a dramatic and powerful down payment that we will see this morning. Now remember, this first main paragraph of Ephesians is chapter, three, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. And in the original Greek, that's one 202-word long sentence. It's just utterly impossible to make sense out of that in English. I, I'm going to drag out my own translation of it one time. I think I did it and made it all one sentence. But I, I had to go to the store and buy more semicolons and some, commons, uh, some commas and some parentheses to make it all happen. So the best rendering, I think, is in our, our version, the New American Standard Bible. And you've seen the breakdown of this passage. Uh, verses 4 through 6 deals with election. That goes all the way back to eternity past. That emphasizes God the Father. Verses 7 through 10 deals with redemption. That is done in the past, but it is how we are standing in Christ now. We are redeemed, and that emphasizes the Son. And then verses 11 through 14, our venue for this morning, deals with our inheritance, which is in the future and you're going to see how marvelously this is connected to the Holy Spirit. So, what have we inherited in Christ? Now, we don't have all the inheritance yet, but it's a done deal. Understand, you have inherited righteousness. You're declared righteous in Christ. Sanctification, holiness, and ever-growing in holiness. You have peace with God. You have the power of God through His work in you. You have the fruit of the Spirit. You get suffering and the strength to endure it. You inherit the kingdom. You have access to the throne of God in prayer and, oh, several dozen other things. Feel free to keep a log of them as you read through the New Testament and especially the New Testament epistles. Now, let's see how Paul describes our inheritance and I know this is going to be kind of out of character, but four whole verses this morning as we look at the final section of this on our inheritance. And you're going to see the benefactor, the basis of the inheritance, the purpose of the inheritance, the requirement of the heirs, 
the guarantee and the substance of the inheritance. And just watch this flow together. First, uh, the benefactor. Now remember, this is all one Greek sentence, but this section of it is absolutely marvelous. In light of what we have in the punctuation of all of this, we really need to back up and catch what in your Bibles is probably the last two words of verse 10. That's where we're going to start, and we'll read that along with verse 11. Pick it up at in Him at the end of verse 10. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will. Now we know the hymn refers to Christ. It is for all who are in Christ. And remember, 27 times in the book of Ephesians that phrase occurs. That's the theme of the book. We are in Christ and here are the riches that we have in Christ. But it is the Father who gives the inheritance. And all that is Christ's is ours. We are fellow heirs with Him. We'll show you that in a minute. Notice it says, in Him also. How, what's the connection of also? Well, in, redem- in, in addition to the redemption that we studied last time. In, ad- in addition to the election that we saw a, a couple of weeks ago. In addition to that, we have also obtained an inheritance. Our benefactor is God the Father. He chose us. He sent His Son to redeem us, and He gives us the great riches both now and forever in Christ. So it's what the Father has given to us in Christ. I said I would refer to this. Here it is, Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. We've seen our adoption. We were predestined to adoption, uh, as we saw earlier in this Master, masterful sentence. We are children of God, and if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. Not only our inheritance, but we share in what the Father gives to the Son. So the benefactor is the Father. Now let's look at the basis of our inheritance. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose who works all things after the counsel of His will. What's the basis of our inheritance? Well, God chose it for us. Having been predestined. And this is one of those things where that the, the verb tense means a lot. It's very significant whether or not you can get goosebumps over discovering an aorist participle connected to the verb obtained and inheritance. But the significance is the choice of the heirs was determined by the predestination. Predestined is that same word we met back in verse 5. It means to mark off beforehand. And if you look carefully at what is said here, this is absolutely thrilling. Who did the planning? Well, it is the one who, according to verse 11 there, works all things according to His will. He's the one that chose that we would be adopted as His children. Now, look at three words here that are a very interesting combination. The word will refers to God's sovereign volition. It's His choice. Right next to that is the word counsel. Counsel, uh, this is the noun form, counsel with an S-E-L, not uh, not counsel with a C-I-L, which is a group that has a meeting. Okay, counsel is the plan that flows from the will of God. So it's by His choice, it is His plan, and purpose means the design or the shape of the plan. In other words, God causes all things to turn out exactly according to the design that is according to the plans of His will. God is in charge of this whole thing. And if you'll notice 
the word works as the one who works all things after the counsel of his will. That's a translation of the Greek word which gets transliterated into English as the noun energy or the verb energize. This is a great statement. God always energizes what he plans with divine energy. That's the basis of our confidence. It's God's work from beginning to end. If you have plans, and you ought to have plans, uh, but if there aren't resources to fulfill your plans or the, the power to execute your plans, then either your plans are not God's plans or at least this isn't God's timing for your plans because here is the promise that God always energizes everything that is according to His plan. So if you grasp that, it'll help you not get stuck on the treadmill of trying to pursue carnal efforts. God will do His plan. Learn all you can about His plan and then go in the direction that He is unfolding His plan. As to our inheritance, it will be worked out by the power of God. The benefactor, the basis of the inheritance now, the purpose of the inheritance. Why does God want us to have this relationship which includes this fantastic inheritance? Well, look at verse 12. To the end, that means here's why I'm doing this, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. Now, you'll understand the purpose of your inheritance if you just take the beginning and the end of that verse. To the end of the praise of His glory. This is all initiated by God. It's all worked out by God. It's all brought to its conclusion by God. So God gets the glory. Now, the little phrase, first to hope, or first to hope in Christ, um, is actually an interesting little tidbit to try to figure out here. First to hope is the uh, best we can do in an English translation of one Greek word. And it, and it seems to imply like, well, maybe the first ones in the gate got something extra. And that's not the case of it at all. Um, it, the meaning of the word is more like pre-hoped as if we pre-hoped in Christ prior to His coming again when we get our inheritance poured out for us and God, God's glory is put on full display. It's referring to all who have hoped in Christ before the second coming, pre-hoped in Him before the fulfillment of it all. Now, it is true that you could take the first to hope in Christ to refer to the apostles. Paul says, we who were the first to hope, but seems to be he's including the Ephesians. You could take that to be the apostles, though, and the other first-generation Jewish believers. They were first on board to be in Christ. But the text goes on to explain that all who have believed share in all of the blessings. So the sense of it is we who hoped in Christ before He comes again, we get all the blessings. Now that points you to the word hope, great theological word in the New Testament. It is that word that means a favorable, confident expectation. It, it's not nail-biting, it's not, gee, I, I hope this works out. This is your trust that God will accomplish everything for His glory, according to His plan. And again, the tense of the verb is significant. Uh, I know you also don't get goosebumps about a perfect tense, but this is a perfect tense, which in Greek means it has been accomplished in the past and the results are in full force now, from then on. It's a, it's a done deal. We have hope. We've placed our hope in Him. We stand in hope. We look forward to the fulfillment of of hope, always continuously abiding in hope, if you will. Christian hope and Christian faith is not something that just happens 
at a point in time. I always say it's, it's not that you once believed, it's that you became a believer. You entered into a life of faith. Faith is not merely a moment, it is a life pattern. Uh, I've had uh, somebody ask me this week, and then I heard, uh, I was listening to a podcast, and somebody had asked the, 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 the same question there, well, I don't know the moment that I came to faith in Christ. Well, you know, I do. I happen to know because I had never heard the gospel. I heard the gospel and I repented and I believed. But if you grew up hearing that, well, was it when you said yes in Sunday school when you were four? Or was it when you said yes at vacation Bible school when you were eight? Or was it when you um, uh, got caught doing something naughty when you were 14? Or was it when you were actually 18? If you've heard the gospel the whole time, it can be difficult to know. But you know what? The answer to that question is, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. The point is, Right now, are you trusting in Christ alone? Are you standing on faith alone, in the grace of God alone, for His glory alone, on the authority of Scripture alone? It's what you're doing right now. That's what matters. And it can get real fuzzy on that front end of it. For me, it was a dramatic thing, but you know what? I was still pretty good at sinning. And I found out the whole difference between me and the other people that I went to college with is they would do something both feet all the way in, in the deep end. I would stick my toe in the waters and I would come out feeling 10 times worse than they did because I was convicted of my sin. And then I would think, oh no, well, would I really have done that if I know the Lord? But see, when you know the Lord, you love the Lord and you hate your sin. How are you doing today. The life of faith is where you stand today. You don't come in and out of it. You enter in, and once you're in, you're sealed. I'll show you that in a few minutes. But understand, to hope in Christ is to fix your abiding trust in Him. And that's how you come to be in Christ. Well, you've seen the benefactor, the basis of the inheritance. You've seen the purpose of the inheritance. Now, what is the requirement of the heirs? Who is qualified to receive this inheritance? The answer is in verse 13. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, the key word there is believed. The ones who are qualified to receive the inheritance are those who believe, those who have faith. And into this verse is woven a great definition of what saving faith is. Notice the phrase, after listening. After listening implies hearing with comprehension, perceiving, understanding. It's a verb form that means that you've listened and understood and that leads to your faith. It precedes the faith. Then comes the message of truth. That's parallel with the gospel of your salvation. It is the message of the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. That Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He appeared to many, read 1 Corinthians 15 and you'll get that. And then, having also believed, completes the definition. Believe is a translation of that word. The the noun form is faith. The verb is pastuo, which comes from a root that means to bind yourself to something. So, heard the message and believed, if you will, three ingredients of saving faith. You have to have the correct message. You have to have an accurate understanding of the correct message, and you have to have a commitment. Romans 10.9 says that for a person to be saved, he or she must make the declaration with their mouth and with their life that Jesus is Lord. In other words, 
you bind yourself to him. You're, it's it's oh, binding yourself in obedience to the Lord. I remember almost 50 years ago, a um, friend of mine, he is with the Lord now. Um, he was in the leadership of the Los Angeles Police Department when bulletproof vests were invented. And he used that to illustrate genuine faith. He described how they were presented to the, offer, to the officers and they had, they had videos and they had these samples you could touch and feel and, 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 and look at and you could see how they would fasten around you and all of that. And they had, they had, they had the videos that showed, you know, slow motion, what happens to the bullet when it hits the, the, the bulletproof vest and then you can take off the vest and the bullet's embedded in it and the person can um, walk away, at least live. And they had the, these elaborate demonstrations and then after they were all convinced it was so cool that something like that could thwart a lethal attack, then they had a problem. Putting those things on when it's 90 degrees outside, that wasn't comfortable. Wearing those things around under your uniform, you might have to get a bigger uniform to be able to wear it uh, underneath. And, uh, and, and, you know, that took time, and that was trouble, and that was, uh, and that was uncomfortable. But you know what? You can't say when the bad guy fires the gun, hold on, let me go get my vest. You have to hear the message of what will save your life, understand it, and put your faith in it. You've got to commit to it. You've got to put that thing on. When we get further into Ephesians, we're going to see things you have to put off and things you have to put on in practice. Well, at the core of that is put on faith. And you've got to commit to putting it on all the time. We're going to see how he tells us to put on the armor of God. You've got to do that every day. Yeah, there will be some discomfort. Some people will hate you. By the way, some of them may shoot fiery darts at you. Like maybe not bullets, but things designed to take you down. So you've seen the benefactor, seen the basis of the inheritance, the purpose of the inheritance, the requirement of the heirs, which is faith. Now, here comes what I think is the best part of this section. It's all great, but this part just makes me smile all over. Ephesians 1, the end of verse 13, the beginning of verse 14. Having also believed, that's the requirement to be an heir, right? You were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. This is great. Sealed is the verb form of a word that means the signet ring, which would be worn by uh, a powerful person, a person in uh, authority. The signet ring would have a reverse image of something in it, and you could take that ring. Joseph was given the signet ring of Pharaoh, and you, could, you would melt some wax onto a document, and then you could press the ring into it to make the impression, and it would have a lot of significance, at least four ways that the idea of that seal was significant. Number one, it attests to the genuine character of something and its authority. If you were here on Wednesday nights, as we worked our way through Esther, Esther 3 and Esther 8 both have examples of that evidence of a seal. It also signifies a finished transaction. Jeremiah 32, 9 and 10 uses it that way. The seal signified that the transaction of buying a field was completed. So it's a done deal. Thirdly, it's a mark of ownership. It's used that way in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. And then fourthly, a seal is a protection mark against tampering or harm. In other words, it's a guarantee of security. And that use is used several times in both the Old and the New Testaments. We sang about it this morning. Who is worthy 
to take the seal and open the scroll. It was sealed at seven intervals along the way. Sealed by the authority of God. You had to have God's authority to be able to open that. And only the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world has that authority. So if you put your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, you have from God a sealed inheritance. And the seal is the Holy Spirit who lives in you. So the Holy Spirit, if you take all those levels of significance of the seal, the Holy Spirit means that you are genuine, Romans 8. It means that your salvation is a finished transaction, Hebrews 10. It means that you belong to God, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 that we looked at last time, or 2, 2 Timothy 2, 19, or you are protected forever in the security of your relationship. We'll see that when we get to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Let me show you a parallel passage that describes almost all the things that we've been seeing in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. It's over in Romans chapter 8, a pivotal chapter in the New Testament defining what it means to be in Christ. And Paul gets down to the end of that and he says this, for verse 29 and 30, for those whom he foreknew, we've already met foreknowledge in Ephesians, right? Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. We've met predestination in Ephesians chapter 1. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom, now listen to this, whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. Do you understand? No one gets lost at any point in that sequence. Every single one that he predestines, he calls effectually to come to the Son. Every single one that he calls is justified. And every single one that he justified is glorified. And notice they're all past tenses. Now, how many of you are glorified? I'm not. Okay? That's a, that's a literary device where you use a past tense because it is so certain even though it's in the future. It's certain because it's guaranteed by God. He's the one whose will is being played out in history. And notice what the Holy Spirit is called in this section back in Ephesians 1. Having also believed, you were sealed in Him, verse 14, with the Holy Spirit of promise who was given as a pledge of our inheritance. He is called the Holy Spirit of promise. This is a reflection of the, the many promises that the Holy Spirit would come that Jesus gave. John 14, John 15, John 16, Acts 1, Acts 2. He is the Holy Spirit who was promised, but He's also the Holy Spirit who guarantees the promises of God. Oh, and by the way, you know what the name of the Holy Spirit is? The Holy Spirit. His first name is Holy, kind of. You might say that. In other words, He's the source of holiness for believers. If you think you can't live a holy life, well, you're right. You can't. But you have in you the spirit of holiness, who is also the spirit of promise. Only the Holy Spirit can enable you to live the life that God wants you to live. And He's the one who empowers you to make the right choices to be holy. File that thought for, oh, I don't know, Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to see that thought over and over again. But here's a summary in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Paul writes, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. That's the context where he says the flesh and the Holy Spirit, they're in opposition to each one another, to one another. That's, that's why there's such a battle. Now, in a lot of preaching these days, it would make you think that 
he really is the jolly spirit or that everything in Christ is all fun and joy and health and wealth and happiness and success. And that's approximately exactly wrong. That's not, it's not a thing about this world. Your inheritance is in the next world. Now, we just read from Proverbs about how much better it is to live righteously than unrighteously. Yes, there's wisdom you can apply that will make your life in this world better, but don't make the mistake, this is not it. As I've said many times, no one who understands the gospel could ever write a book for Christians and call it your best life now. That is a bald-faced lie. You can't say that unless you're going to hell. Your best life is, oh my word, it is with God in the presence of the Lord. It's in the new heaven and the new earth. So you can walk by the Spirit and you will have victory over sin. You will have blessings. But part of the blessing is that if you look like Jesus, the world's going to treat you like they treated Jesus. And they hated Him. So indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's in this world. Second Timothy 3.12 but because you are sealed for the day of redemption, you have the power to face what comes to you in this world because of your commitment of faith to Christ. Now notice again the beginning of verse 14. Having also believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of your inheritance. Now pledge is a really cool word. It means something like a, a down payment. Or if, if they had the concept that we have of engagement ring, this is the word that would best fit it. A man can say to a woman, I love you. I want to be with you. I would like to spend the rest of my life with you. Now that's great. But if it's accompanied by a diamond, it means more, right, Easton? Okay. He just tested this verse. It worked. All right? God has done just that for you. He has given you something to say. Now, I, don't, I don't hope you make it. I guarantee you make it. I am the guarantee. If you've ever bought a house... You, uh, you had to make an offer and just to make the offer you had to give a chunk of money and it was held it would be held toward the purchase if it comes through but you had to give a chunk of money to validate your offer is for real in our world we call that earnest money right well go read the King James and see what in Elizabethan English they translated this word as the earnest of our inheritance, the one that guarantees that the one who is making the promise will come through. That's exactly what God has done. He is committed to you and He gives you the guarantee of the full inheritance. He chose you, He saved you, He sealed you, and He empowers you all the while by giving you the down payment on eternity who also provides the power for you to live for His glory right now. What about your inheritance? Well, you've seen the benefactor, the basis, the purpose, the requirement of the heirs, the guarantee, now the substance of the inheritance. It's in verse 14. It was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Now, think this through. The previous little section that we studied was on the doctrine of redemption, right? That we have been redeemed. Christ went and paid the price to set us free from our slavery to sin so that we can now, by our own choice, follow Him uh, in love. Well, now He's saying, even though He just told you you're redeemed, that the Holy Spirit is given in a pledge with a view to 
the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Here's how you put that together. There's still another step in your redemption. Oh, the price is paid. The deal is done. The guarantee is irrevocable. But there's still a final phase. We, as a matter of fact, usually call it final redemption. That final redemption is when you're set free from what Romans 7 calls the body of this death. You're set free with your, all of your links to the, uh, to the evil world system through your own uh, flesh. That's all severed and you're given a new body which is sinless, perfect, deathless, and perfect for being in the presence of God forever. So you have justification. You've been declared righteous. You've been redeemed. You have sanctification going on. God already sees you perfectly holy in Christ. But as you mature in your walk with Him, you grow in sanctification. But this is talking about glorification, that final step. Justification is yours now. Sanctification is in process. Glorification is coming. And the Holy Spirit is the guarantee that sanctification will be finalized. Glorification will occur. That's all wrapped up in the redemption that is God's own redemption of God's own possession. What is God's own possession? Well, God gave to the Son a bride. The bride is the church. This is talking about the final glorification of those people that God has called together in the church, the body of Christ, which is also the bride of Christ. What is your inheritance? It's the fulfillment of every single promise of God to the praise of His glory. What, how many times have we seen that here? Two in this four verses, and I think at least one or two more other times always already through this magnificent sentence here. In Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, you're told that every spiritual blessing is yours in the heavenlies in Christ. And then Paul elaborated by telling us about election. And this is the eternal plan of God from before the foundation of the world. He's told you about redemption, the eternal plan of God worked out in history where Christ died for our sins. And then the inheritance, the eternal plan of God with a guaranteed future. There's another place that says all of this. I mentioned to you last week the, the similarity between the beginning of Ephesians and the beginning of 1 Peter. Well, you know what? Uh, Peter and Paul knew each other. They interacted with each other. They both mention each other in their writings. They overlap in the, in the book of Acts by, uh, by four or five chapters. And, and before God even called Paul, the apostle, to the Gentiles, he used Peter to open the door to the Gentiles to make the point to the Jewish believers that this isn't just your ball game. Jew and Gentile together in Christ, you are all one. And I love the way Peter says the same things that... Paul said, so you understand it was one and the same message. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you read that far and you say, wait a minute, is he reading 1 Peter or is he reading Ephesians? Exactly the same words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again. Oh, we're working through that in our daily studies in John, aren't we? Where Jesus introduced that concept to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, what do you need to get into the kingdom of heaven? Something you absolutely can't do. You need to be born again. You can't do that. You can't crawl into the womb. And Nicodemus figured that out. But God has caused you to be born again to a living hope, same word, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance. But now Peter went a little bit further in describing some things about this. 
an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. Okay, well, I know the inheritance is safe, but how do you know I'm going to get there? Look at the next part. Reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You can go listen to our sermons on 1 Peter 1. That is a glorious, glorious parallel passage to Ephesians chapter 1. In your hymnals, and I'm not asking to have you turn there, but if you were to look at number 403, you would find some famous words from the pen of a woman named Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby lost her eyesight at the ripe old age of six weeks. She had an eye infection and it was mistreated by a doctor. I thought of Fanny one day. I was getting ready to come to church on a Wednesday night and my one of my contacts was all gunky, so I, I took it out and I rinsed it and I always use uh, artificial tears to kind of, you know, wash things out and make it a little more smooth when it goes back in. And, and as things were a little bit blurry, I reached down, I grabbed the bottle, I tucked my head back, I quick put in two drops and then discovered I had grabbed the bottle of contact lens cleanser. Praise the Lord, I didn't come out like Fanny Crosby, but I thought of her. I really did remember her story when I wondered, will that I ever work again? I even made it to church that night, didn't wear my contacts, and I had one bright red eye. But I understand, totally blind, and yet she saw countless truths from the Word of God and put them into words. Do you know that woman wrote over 8,000 hymns? Now, think about how many days there are in a year. If you wrote one a day, it would take you a little less than three years. Let's say three years, because maybe you'd take off Christmas and Easter. Maybe you might even, uh, you know, you might even take off uh, Sundays. So it would take three years to write a 1,000. If you wrote one a day, 30 years if you wrote one a day. She just kept pouring it out. And you know what? That lady knew Ephesians chapter 1. I don't know if it was read to her. I don't know if she read it in Braille. Oh, but it was in her heart. You know her words. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. Purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. You have the assurance of a guaranteed inheritance. And let's pray. Oh, Father, our hearts just soar with looking at this portion of Your Word. Thank You for that inheritance. Remind us of it when we are being buffeted by a world that rejects you and doesn't like those who stand with you. And Father, please, if, if there's anyone listening or watching this morning that isn't certain of the guarantee of their inheritance with you, oh, may this be the day that you open that heart and open those spiritual eyes that we might see the riches of the glory of all that is ours in Christ, in whose name we pray.